Okay, welcome to the presentation. My name is Troy Patton. I'm a CPA uh, with Archer Investment Corporation, and this presentation is on behalf of Paul Sullivan. And uh, I appreciate the uh, Sullivan team for inviting us to do this call. And basically, is what we're going to do is we're going to be discussing, uh, as we say on here on slide two, state of the markets. Should you be optimistic for the rest of 2014 and beyond? Where do we go from here, and can these returns continue? Well, where are we today? Obviously, we've seen the markets continue to climb upward, and uh, in fact, uh, even as of today, even with a little bit of a downturn here uh, recently, the markets have still continued to climb upward. And obviously, as you can see here by the slide, uh, and slide three, that it's not always straight up and down, or, I mean, it's... The market's going to – every day is going to give us a price. And some days it's going to be a little bit higher, and some days it's going to be a little bit lower. And there's going to be times, just like as you can see here in August, towards the end of this uh, end of this chart, that there are going to be some downturns. And we're going to have to endure those downturns. And, uh, frankly, some of those downturns aren't steep as others. Uh, but it's pretty normal. Um, since the 1920s, we've had over 100 downturns of nearly 20% in the market. Um, but amazingly enough, we're still higher. So, I mean, there's going to be times that different things in the world uh, impact the markets. And obviously right now there's a lot going on, not only in the Middle East, but in uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, South America, uh, Africa, uh, and as well in Europe. So, anyways. Um, let, let's talk about here on the home front, though, and let's talk about our gross domestic product. As most of you know, our gross domestic product, product is made up of the goods and services that are offered to the American people or, frankly, even overseas in terms of the dollar value. And it is what I'm looking at here. This is a chart of – it's called real GDP. And the line right across the middle here on slide four is when GDP uh, goes negative and sometimes it goes as positive. Obviously, we like to see our gross domestic product or goods and services growing by about somewhere between 3 and 5% every year. It doesn't always happen. In fact, at the start of this year in January, as indicated by the last line on this graph, it's actually down. Okay, It doesn't always mean a recession. In fact, these two blue arrows that I put on here, I'm showing other areas where we were down one quarter on gross domestic product, but yet it didn't indicate a recession. The gray marks or the gray um, lines in here are, are where we had uh, different recessions. So obviously the weather was really bad this uh, uh, this holiday season in January through March. I mean, here in the Midwest where I'm located, um, there were there were times that people weren't even coming into work. Uh, we had so much snow, and and here when we say so much, I mean it's 10 inches or something like that. But um, out in Colorado, I'm sure they're used to it, but around here it kind of grinds everybody to a halt. The other thing I'd like to point out is um, that our, even though people talk about the economy doing well, I, we generally think the economy um, if the economy is doing well when profits of corporations are higher than the t than the previous period before, and is what this uh, these red lines indicate uh, here on on slide five is that this is uh, earnings that have gone up. From quarter over quarter, so from January to January or January through March compared to the January through March in the previous year, are earnings higher this time around than last time? And as you can see, most of the time it, it, it generally is. Um, the, the times, these little dips in here are sometimes recessionary periods of time. And obviously, when they were negative back in the 2008, 2009, the Great uh, Recession, as they're calling it, um, uh, earnings were actually negative. A lot of that was driven by the banks and financial institutions, but quite frankly, uh, earnings as a whole were negative. Now we've gone back to being positive, although quite frankly, uh, these last uh, this last quarter, uh, we've really been around that 1.39 mark. So it's, again, showing a little bit of a slowing economy, or, and not even slowing, I'd say, uh, smaller increases in the economy than in, than what we've seen in the past. We really haven't seen a, a, any kind of sharp drops, just maybe a slowing of increases. Okay. Um, 
as most of you have been or heard some of our conversations in the past, I mean, this slide I always use, and it's the Big Mac from McDonald's in the springs. You know, the, the market gives us different prices every day. And, and when you – if you were to buy McDonald's in 1979 and you sold it in 1989, even though profits tripled at McDonald's, you actually wouldn't you, – you may have not have made money. And the, the, because sometimes the stock, uh, the stock market gives us a better price one day than the next depending on what's going on. So anyways, um, I, 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 think, uh, I think that as we look at history and, – and by the way, since my father was a history teacher, I like to look at history. So on page – or on slide six, I really just want to point out that sometimes – Profits go up, but the market goes down, and vice versa. Sometimes profits go down, and and a stock's price will go up because it's influenced by other things outside of the stock market. Okay. Since uh, the Great Recession that we've had in 2008 and 9, you can see here that stocks uh, really have can uh, or have become less and less part of a person's portfolio. We've had a lot of people that the 2008 and 2009 recession, the Great Recession, has really left them out, and they really don't want to. Um, they really don't want to go back into that market um, uh, because they're fearful that we're going to see another decline. Okay. So the question is, after hearing some of this, you may say, well, you know, I mean, Troy, are, are you bullish or are you not bullish? Well. I am bullish, and, he, and and this is a chart that I've been using uh, ever since coming to uh, the Sullivan team's presentations that we've been doing, and this is one I showed actually back in, I believe it was 2009 or 10 when we first did one, and I said, I said, hey, I mean, let's let's make no mistake about it. Um, Any time we see a 10 to 16 year of negative performance in the in the stock market, it usually indicates an up cycle of 20 to 25 years. We can see that even back to 1910 from the Great Depression. Uh, it, down uh, through the uh, 60s, um, I mean, there's a blip here in, uh, for World War II uh, time frame, uh, the 60s with the Vietnam War uh, dragging the market down and then back up in a big period of time. Again, we've had the Great Recession, and so what we're, we're estimating is another 20-year up cycle, and, and hopefully that's the case because um, obviously that would, be, that would bode well for uh, folks that have owned, have owned stocks. As you can see, prices from the from their bottom uh, increased 500 percent, 569 percent, 484 percent. From our from our bottom right now, I mean, we're looking in particular uh, of about a 200 percent uh, stock market increase uh, from the bottom. So maybe we have another 100 percent to go over the next 20 years, maybe it's, maybe it, which would indicate a 5% approximate return per year, or maybe we have another 200% to go uh, over the next uh, so many years, okay? <clears throat> many of you um, that, that invest in stocks, uh, whether it be through us uh, or through the Sullivan team, um, you, you might say, oh, wow, I mean, I mean, th this whole sell in May and go away time period, I mean, uh, stocks generally don't don't do well. Well, we're right here on, on slide ten. It, you're correct. I mean, we're, we're the, the market generally returns a pretty dismal 1.1 percent. That's what that says right here. 1.1 percent in the May to October time period. But if you look what follows that time period in that after that midterm election year, right after the election period is over here in November, we really start to see an upswing in the stock market. Uh, generally, it's because we have the, the next group of politicians in there. People are trying to get things done. There's more activity uh, uh, in Washington. Sometimes that's good and bad. Uh, but in general, um, we generally see uh, an uptick in the market. And frankly, that's what we're looking to. Um, outside of um, external forces that may impact our markets, which we will talk about, I would generally say that you know we believe that there's more upside to this market. Okay. Now, conversely to that, small caps. If you take a look at uh, small caps, have really performed uh, poorly this year. In fact, they're they're, they're down. Um, but small caps tend to have wider swings. So here on slide 11, you can see where in the May to October period, it's actually usually a negative 10%. We're running about a negative, I think, 6%, maybe somewhere around there. Um, but then obviously that November to April time period. 
right after that midterm election year and in those November elections, the market generally t tends to really take off, which bodes well for, for small caps. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip that slide. Let's go to 13. One, one of the reasons I really I, I feel like there's a lot of activity going on in the U United States stock market right now is if you look at this slide, the average age of the vehicles has continued to increase. In fact, um, the age now is around 11.4 years. A lot of the stocks that are doing well right now are, are tied to the auto sector. In fact, I was recently listening to um, the chief futurist of Cisco Systems, and the number one um, area that's uh, or number one industry that's spending money on technology these days is autos. I mean, we're talking about driverless auto automobiles. Uh, the hybrids that are out now out are are getting 40, 50 miles a gallon. Uh, uh, there's becoming more and more uh, the, the autos are becoming more and more electrical, I guess, in nature. Um, we're going to see um, some of the Apple. Um, software uh, input into autos called Apple CarPlay. I think that bodes well, not only for Apple, but obviously for the auto industry is, um, it may not bode well for Sirius Radio, but, um, but but for some of the others, it really bodes well. I mean, we're seeing some cars come with Wi-Fi now. It's really interesting. And, and we can, so we continue to see, there's probably gonna be a lot of new auto sales um, over the next uh, several years as we as we try to cycle back to some kind of um, average number of uh, age of vehicles on the road. Okay. Um, again, here in, in, in not only here in the U.S. but also around the world, the global manufacturing. Anytime it's above this line on on slide 14, anytime it's above that line means ex, uh, manufacturing is actually expanding, and I think that's important. Obviously, not only for the economy but for the stock markets as well. Okay. Well, I mean, there are a lot of good cases for the for the bull market. I mean, obviously, you know, we can we can we can expand further into interest rates are very low. It's easy to borrow, and and that sort of thing. Um, but um, we need to we can't be blind. We have to look at maybe cases for a bear market also. So as what I've done here is put up these cases for a bear and said, you know, here, here's some red flags uh, that we that we probably ought to be looking for. And some of those, some of them we've actually hit. Uh, treasuries have rallied a bit. Uh, the European mark, or excuse me, emerging markets are slowing. We haven't seen negative surprises from Europe, although we may, as as they're having a little bit of a tough time. And we've seen the dollar strengthen here recently, and and maybe the housing recoveries starting to slow down just a bit. But if you look at all these other things, I mean, really, there's still a lot of um, a lot, a lot of uh, really good things in the works. Um, uh, really, uh, employment staying up approximately the same. Manufacturing is doing well. Um, uh, we can we can look and say that the uh, forward earnings, which means how much are companies going to earn uh, in the future, seems to be still be pretty solid. So the case for a bear, you know, I, I just I just don't see it at this point. I mean, could we could we contract 10% in the market? Of course we can, and that's normal. So, you know, if we do, I, I think it really presents a good buying opportunity or a chance to start averaging more money into the market. Okay. Um, the, the next slide on 16 is the end near. Uh, basically, looking at the M1 money supply, um, the only thing that I would say here is obviously we've seen the Fed um, increase their balance sheet dramatically by buying, you know, billions of treasuries. I don't think they'll ever work their way out of it. I just think it's going to be an expansion of the balance sheet, and it'll stay there as, as those treasuries become due. They'll take those money or take those monies and buy more. Um, uh, unfortunately, I, I do think that will bode uh, poorly for inflation somewhere down the road. But the only thing I would tell you is that you know we also thought that about Japan in the 80s and the early 80s, and Japan's actually been at a near a zero interest rate policy for decades now. And it really hasn't impacted them. And part of the reason is the rest of the world continues to print money. It's not just the United States. It's, it's the, the European Union, uh, South America, Japan, uh, everywhere. It's kind of that race to the bottom, as they say. And the reason is because that makes everyone's exports uh, uh, more competitive. So, you know, general theory would support 
<clears throat> excuse me, higher interest rates. Um, uh, however, it's very possible that you know we continue to see this intervention by governments around the world uh, to keep interest rates low. Okay. Um, this next slide on 17. It, it, if you ever get a chance, go out to shadowstats.com. It's not meant to scare you, but it is meant to show you that there is inflation out there. As I've always said, for those of, for those of you who are, are listening to this uh, recording that don't eat and don't drive, you're right. There's no inflation. For the rest of us, there really is inflation, and it's more than one to two percent a year. Uh, hog prices, cattle prices, things like that have really gone up. Uh, some of you may point out and say, hey, well, gold prices are down. Well, you're right, but we can't eat gold. Uh, gold outside of the manufacturing uh, use of gold, for me, has no uh, value. I'm not saying that we don't occasionally buy some strategic opportunities there, but uh, generally speaking, we are not gold bugs. Uh, I'd, I'd like to stay away from that. Um, if you really have that philosophy, you probably ought to buy canned goods and, and guns and things like that. <laughs> I mean, because gold isn't necessarily going to have a, a great place. In fact, I believe it'll continue to decline down to about 950 per ounce. Okay. Um, again, when we look at that inflation from uh, the uh, slide 17 and look at it on slide 18, the one thing that we have to be cognizant of is that even though our GDP is positive, some of that's driven by that, quote, non-inflation uh, that we have. Uh, if we really uh, factor in the number of goods that are produced, we actually may see uh, somewhat of a negative um, uh, or a, a decline in our gross domestic product. For instance, a can of Pepsi used to cost 50 cents. Now it may be 75 cents to a dollar in the machine. Um, that's called inflation. Okay. Um, and again, uh, if you look at sli slide 19, th this is really where I I'd like to show. You know, a lot of us believe that, hey, gosh, the Federal Reserve is going to tighten interest rates. They're going to raise interest rates. They're going to quit buying all these treasuries and all these uh, collateral-backed um, uh, obligations on the open market. You know, billions of dollars. Uh, I mean, what generally happens uh, when, when that to the stock market when that happens? Well, as we can see. On, on this chart on, on 19, the blue line is the previous five times that that, that very occurrence has happened. And the gray line is what, what the stock market's done currently. And as we can see, you know, one year before, when we know it's coming, generally the market does contract a bit. And in fact, it may drop, you know, 10% or so, uh, or 8 to 10%. But then it, it, it really has taken off the last five times. This is, the, again, this is the average. Uh, the one thing I will tell you, because a lot of people always ask me, they say, you know, gosh, if it's going to drop, you know, should I wait to buy in? The problem, the problem with that thinking is, is that oftentimes people are always waiting for that next drop, and it never comes, or it goes up 10% and drops 5%, or goes up 12 and then drops 10. Well, you're still 2% behind. Um, so you, you need to be cognizant. If you're going to be in the market, you need to make, you know, take that. Um, take that opportunity to buy into the market and invest. Because again, investing over time, again, not, not trying to speculate. Uh, speculating is made, for, is made for casinos, and we know who has all the money on the casino side. The casino, not us. Um, investing is though, for those who, can, who, who will bide their time and uh, ride out these small ups and downs like we see here on 19, and, and hopefully uh, look forward to more upside, okay? Um, generally speaking, uh, with the smaller stocks, though, the smaller stocks, as you can see, the one year before tightening, they generally tend to stay somewhat more flat. Now, obviously, this uh, this is um, uh, uh, just the opposite of what we've shown in that chart where we showed the mid-year election cycle and, and, and where we saw that big increase. So we have a little bit of conflicting information here. Um, uh, where we're about ready to tighten, yet at the same time we're in a midterm election year. So I do see a recovery of the small caps, but because uh, history tells us that during this uh, period of time, uh, potentially before tightening, uh, should they decide to tighten, that the stock market generally declines. And as you can see, one year before tightening, the small caps tend to decline somewhat, and obviously we have this time as well. 
Okay. Uh, the international is the same way. Generally speaking, the United States stock market is the place to be one year before tightening, not necessarily international stock markets. Okay. Um, the next one's on uh, the slide on 22. I'm going to skip that. That's generally for interest rates, but uh, you know what else? I will say one thing about that. Obviously, as you can again, you can see the last uh, five, uh, five times uh, before the before they tightened on interest rates, actually interest rates declined. They did not go up. They, you know, without without some of that uh, intervention, um, the the stock the stock market continues to climb, but yet in turn, um, uh, the the yields tend to drop a bit. And we may see that again. I mean, they may drop by another half percent. I mean, we could see the ten year. Uh, gosh, I mean, uh, at 1.8%, 1.75%, that in turn would fuel another, a new housing recovery once again. I'm, I'm pretty confident of that. Okay. All right. On slide 23, uh, I'm going to point out one thing here, and, and this is kind of to toot our own horn. We really have been, been right on the stock market. We This is the low barrier, mid barrier, and obviously there is a high barrier where we thought the S&P 500 would be. And as you can see in 2014, we really thought, you know, 1680 was that low barrier. 2040 is where it should be fairly priced by the end of 2014. So we've got another 5 to 6% upside there. And as you can see, we continue to see earnings trends in, the, in a positive light going out to 2017, which could then continue that climb in the stock market. Although it doesn't decrease the low barrier that, that much, it really does just increases that mid barrier and upper barrier. Anything beyond this purple uh, line where the mid-barrier is, would generally what we would consider that would tend to be somewhat some irrational exuberance. Okay. So with that being said, again, I'd like to I'd like to thank you for being on the call today. Hopefully that was short and sweet. If you have any questions, please contact someone someone on the Sullivan team. We think uh, uh, they do a really good job. We think they're they're great people, and, and they really are looking out for your best interests. Again, my name is Troy Patton. I'm with Archer Investment Corporation. We handle a lot of the asset management behind the Sullivan team and, uh, and, and actually manage uh, Novo Mutual Funds ourselves, of which uh, the Sullivan team uh, can help you with, um, as well as other investments. Again, thank you for your time today. And if you ever have any questions, feel free to contact someone on their team or get in touch with them uh, and get in touch with us, and we'd be more than happy to help you. Thank you, and have a good day. 